uh, Quincy uh, of Electric Era presenting. And I can't remember, is there somebody introducing yep. you? Is it Gabe? Would, yep, Gabe Cunningham here. So happy, right, good. happy to introduce uh, Quincy. All right. Um, so, it. yeah, so Quincy's the co founder and CEO of Electric Era. Um, you know, I think in terms of what they're delivering, they're delivering a high powered storage system um, for fast charging stations. And, you know, I think just in the electric vehicle industry, we're kind of building the plane as it's taking off. Um, with this biggest shift in the automotive industry in the past century. Um, and so, you know, I think one key aspect of electric era is that they take the pressure off you off the utilities um, to be the bottleneck here because their rollout plans, um, you know, will hamper electric vehicle rollouts um, with charging stations and things like that. So their technology helps alleviate that. Um, you know, I think the, the key takeaway from my interactions with Quincy is just that, um, you know, he left a career seven years at SpaceX um, to go launch this company. And so obviously, you know, moving from one incredibly motivating mission um, to another. And, you know, what's impressed me is just he's built um, an extraordinarily kind of capable dynamic team that's built to scale that, you know, is thinking about, you know, what it takes to build this into a, a, a large company and kind of uh, meet this major shift that's happening. So Quincy, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, thanks, Gabe. Uh, I really appreciate that, that very glowing introduction. Hopefully I can live up to it. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen here for a second and get into this presentation. Um, yeah, nice to meet everybody on the phone. My name is Quincy. Um, you know, as Gabe mentioned, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Electric Era. I'm really excited to talk to you all today about all today about the our high power battery technology and how we really see it as a central feature of uh, you know the rapid and affordable electrification of the transportation sector's power supply. Um, <clears throat> as Gabe mentioned, you know I came from a world of of you know space engineering. I was at SpaceX as a mechanical engineer, um, you know for seven years, you know working on rocketry, spacecraft engineering, and a variety of other things and. That got me thinking as I was, when I was asked to present at this conference, uh, you know, it got me thinking to uh, the question of like, what can e-mobility learn from satellite mega constellations? Um, in my last role at SpaceX, I was in charge of uh, the global rollout of the Gateway Ground Station Antenna Network, which are the large snow globe uh, objects that you can see on the bottom left hand of your screen. Um, satellite mega constellations are, are pretty straightforward. You just need to do three things very well. You need to deploy thousands of satellites on orbit. You need to build, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of user terminals and deploy them on people's roofs. And uh, you need to deploy your, your gateway ground station antennas all around the world. Uh, these are the large RF parabolic antennas that act as the intermediary between um, the satellites on orbit and the terrestrial based internet. And obviously all three of these things are very, very difficult. Um, the, the gate, I, I found that the gateway ground station antenna program had an additional layer of complexity on top of it, uh, specifically pertaining to the fact that it was a technology deployment into an existing infrastructural asset. Uh, in this case, it was the global telecommunications fiber optic backbone. Um, that, that, and that, 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 it, that integration into an existing infrastructural asset presented an, an additional layer of complexity. So kind of feeding this forward into the world of e-mobility, I, I realized that there were kind of a lot of uh, uh, corollaries and, and overlap between what we we're proposing, what we were proposing to do in, with you know satellite mega constellation, and and really what's going to transpire over the next decade with the massive rollout of uh, the charging infrastructure, um, and you know kind of the main corollary is is really that you know with charging infrastructure we're deploying it into arguably one of the most you know sophisticated and complicated technology pieces of technology in the world, but the electrical grid, um, and this is a very fixed asset that has. You know, kind of a high degree of co a high coefficient of friction uh, in in terms of interoperability and integration with with new features. It is is not dynamic. It is not agile, and it is it's fairly slow to upgrade. And you know, thinking through this, we we've really realized that at, at Electric Era that charging and grid infrastructure will impede e mobility growth. Um, you know, unless addressed properly. So to take a step back, you know, and really assess like how big of an order of magnitude of problem this, this will be, we really have to ask ourselves the question, what does the next decade look like for passenger EVs um, and passenger EV charging? 
So when when we founded this company, we we asked ourselves this basic question, and we ran some you know basic math um, and basic simulations, and realized that by 2030, the 24 million electric vehicles, passenger vehicles that will be on American roads, will consume around 300 gigawatt hours of daily energy. So this is this is not fleets, this is not freights, this is not ferries or electric vehicles. Um, this is just strictly passenger EVs, and this is. This is a staggering amount of energy. Um, in, in my younger years, I was a nuclear engineer and, and kind of have uh, you know energy on the brain. And when I when I ran that number, I realized, wow, this is a, a major major opportunity for utilities and challenge for the broader e mobility community. Um, the the electrical generation of that energy is is doable. It's you know it's going to be you know an uptick in generation capacities. But what the real problem is is the manifestation of that in the you know the actual um, grid infrastructure on our streets and on our roads and at our gas stations that can get converted hopefully to charging stations. The actual deployment of that charging infrastructure that will distribute those electrons is, is an exceedingly complicated challenge. And to really understand why, you have to kind of understand a little bit about how the grid works. So you can see a graphic on your screen that shows the, the customer you know, kind of the various different layers of the grid. This is from a Black and Beach paper that I would encourage you all to read entitled, you know, Understanding and De-Risking EV Charging Power Delivery. So what this graphic shows is from everything from the customer property to the distribution for feeder circuitry all the way up to your distribution substations. Um, the, and the ver so the various different levels of the electrical grid that, you know, EV charging uh, actually interfaces with. Um, and then importantly, on the, the top part of the page, you can see kind of the grid power threshold level where, you know, a different charging station uh, power levels start to interface and require overhaul of various different parts of this circuitry stack. So for, you know, smaller stations, smaller EV charging stations like an EVgo, you know, you're, you're looking at less than a megawatt of power. Um, you're only really, you know, looking to uh, make alterations to your customer property, things like your local transformer or your primary conductor, maybe your medium voltage distribution panel. Certainly you have to do a lot of conduit and trenching. Uh, when you get a little larger and you're looking at like Electrify America stations or you're looking at Tesla superchargers and you're above a megawatt and, you know, really beneath 10 megawatts, you're, you're starting to actually need to, you know, interface and, and reconductorize or alter or interact with your distribution circuit. This is, you know, the kind of power lines you see when you drive ahead, you know, driving around the city. They're medium voltage distribution lines. They took years to build. They took years to plan, and they're quite complex in nature. Um, and, you know, when you get to higher power levels, like what will be needed for EV charging hubs um, and and electric ferries, which will, which will come, um, you, you're starting to have to add transformer bakes at your substations or build entirely new substations. So these are these are all major undertakings. They kind of are different levels of step function in terms of difficulty, but they all have the common denominator of being very long lead time and very expensive. Um, and, and that is exactly the problem that we are aiming to solve at Electric Air. We're, we're specifically focused on solving the DC fast charging power problem for time sensitive modes of transportation. So you know, where software solutions work, like Mofi introduced uh, mentioned earlier on the call, we should definitely leverage software solutions to, to power throttle and, and peak shape uh, with, with software. But for a large cohort of the transportation modes that will be coming online, this is simply not an option because fundamentally these are commercialized uh, forms of transportation that are optimizing for uptime. Uh, they're, they're not making money unless they're, they're driving around and they need to fast charge and optimize the, their drive, drivability. Um, so therefore they're fast charging and, and really can't leverage software for a slow charge. Um, this, this, this is a, this is a fun, fundamentally a problem and a very difficult problem, ultimately because DC fast charging is just very transient in nature and very powerful. Uh, you can see uh, one of the most interesting graphs I've looked at in a long time of the Model 3 native EV fast charging load profile. So, you know, on your screen, you can basically how, see how power spikes up to 250 kW for a very, very short amount of time and then, and then kind of rolls off uh, after the fact. Um, so fast charging is powerful for short durations, but on average over a 30 or 15 minute charging window is, is basically about half of your 250 kilowatt peak. So there's a peak to average ratio here of about two to one for an individual car. 
And how this plays out at a low utilization DC fast charging station is you know, kind of representative of, of a pretty unhealthy load profile. You can see a month worth of data at a low utilization um, small station that has maybe you know, 20 cars come through in the entire month. And you know, they're all pulling you know, at max 65 kW and really not pulling a lot of energy. This would be a, a utility operator's nightmare um, and ultimately an owner's nightmare because as you all know, this, this is a fairly expensive from a demand charge standpoint. Um, the same problem actually plays out for high utilizations in a pretty egregious way as well. So DC fast charging stations that are high utilization have the same characteristic high spiky load profiles um, that you know the, the lower utilizations have. They have, of course, a higher threshold of average power. But on top of that, with the transient nature of cars that are coming through, you see breakout coincident loads spiking and pulling peak power at, um, at the charging station. Um, so this is, you know, this is the load profile we saw that made us realize, wow, this industry really needs a, a novel piece of technology that really isn't found in the market yet. So Electric Air is ultimately optimizing for high power delivery. We're a high power storage asset. You know, we built a high, uh, you know, purpose built high power battery that's, that's capable of 20 minute discharges and 10,000 cy continuous cycles over and over and over again. You know, there's no thermal limitations on this asset and that's actually critically important. Um, we built this at the lowest battery cost of anything on the market to deliver this high power to the load. And we've made it specifically integratable into the EV charging ecosystem, leveraging, you know, the, the brilliant, you know, OCPP software standards that allow us to kind of integrate across the partner stack. We've also layered an intelligence to the asset that allows, uh, you know, ancillary market participation, turning an EV charging station from a, a cost leader to a source of revenue for owners and operators. Um, and by using this piece of technology, you know, we can unlock some really exciting advantages. We can peak shave. Um, we can peak shave time sensitive charging. Um, and we can peak shave quite well, um, given that it is a high power tailored battery pack. Um, so, you know, referencing back to our low utilization station, we were, you know, able in simulation to show us an 85% decrease in, in power, peak power at the charging station site while maintaining 100% uptime. Um, the same is true for the high utilization station. We were, we were able to show about a 50% reduction, actually a little bit more than a 50% reduction while again, maintaining 100% station uptime um, by peak shaving with a, a very tailored spe specific piece of technology. So, you know, really thinking about how to use in-situ storage, uh, it gives customers, owners and partners in this, this massive undertaking we're all taking, um, uh, the, the benefit of minimizing grid impacts uh, minimizing demand charge costs and minimizing capex infrastructural investment for station activation, and it's you know it's fairly simple. It's an idea that we've all had, we, we, you know, in the, in the in this in this community, but you know, uh, mandated it somewhat mandated it a brand new piece of technology. So by pairing you know electric air batteries with you know charging stations and really tapping into this aggressive aggressive reduction in peak power. We can, as a community, grow this, you know, platform and grow this effort at a much, in much higher favorable, favor, and favorable scaling rates. Um, from a practical standpoint, this means, you know, there's there's uh, opportunities to stay beneath critical thresholds. Uh, referencing back to the great infrastructure picture from earlier, uh, you know, staying beneath, for example, 2,000 kVA transformer sizes. This is like a very, very difficult step function in complexity that you can run into when you're building out a charging station and you know, this is when you start to get into overhauling your up circuit circuitry. So using this te technology strategically uh, and, and building at the, at the edge with storage um, is, is a way we can all accelerate this, this phase change faster. Um, and, and to demonstrate this, we, we've actually launched a, an EV charging station configurator tool on our website right now uh, at electricairtechnologies.com that allows you to configure and play around with different station sizes at different times of the year, capping your base power at, at you know, increasingly lower levels and plugging in various different demand charges costs. So the user can get an intuitive understanding of really what type of savings are possible with this type of technology. Um, and you know, ultimately this allows users to tailor their stations with different in-situ storage amount quantities to minimize cost and in infrastructure. Um, so to, to step back again and ask ourselves the question, what does the, the next decade look like for us all on the call? Um, you know, everybody's got a different answer for that, obviously. With Electric Air, we really see that question and we think 
we, we, we see that question and we see a world where uh, the next decade is manifestable with a 50% reduction in grid infrastructure build out, um, which means you know, a 50% reduction in demand charge costs and a, a, a very large reduction in CapEx infrastructure and a, and a very large reduction in lead time for station activation. Um, and again, this is all realizable for time sensitive charging applications, which is you know, kind of an unserviced part of the market where people haven't had a lot of choices. Kind of our goal is to avoid you know, long-term project management fees and grid impact studies and the massive amounts of cost that one incurs when building out large megawatt level charging stations and, and by, by ultimately leveraging our you know, high power, fastest charging battery technology. Um, so again, this company was founded to, like many people on this phone, uh, with the vision of enabling the rapid and affordable electrification of the transportation sector's power supply. And we really see, you know, you know, edge power and edge storage, in situ storage as a key enabling feature of that. Um, so that's the last slide. Thank you for your time. And I'll pause here for questions. Hey, Quincy, that was a great presentation. Um, I, I have actually two questions. One, one is um, sort of a, a background question on your technology. So I, th I think it's pretty obvious the value that you could add if you accomplish all these things. Um, what is it about your platform though that is the most difficult that you've done and always is there some unique thing about your technology is there some uh, unusual part of your technology that's defensible what what's been most difficult about building this platform yeah i mean one of the fundamental things that we're really targeting is you know the ultimately convective heat transfer uh liquid cooling solutions from that, that facilitate um heat rejection from the battery cell to the ambient environment and then when on operation at an EV charging station, uh, there's, there's a sophisticated software stack that runs on top of that that allows for you know, predictively conditioning your battery in a specific thermal environment to increase performance and also increase revenue from other ancillary service revenue uh, making marketplaces. So uh, it, it's, all, it's ultimately a combination of hardware and software, um, specifically you know, the in situ thermal management that we do at the EV charging station site and the, the embedded hardware IP and technology that we've built out ultimately enable all this. And is it something that, is it a um, platform that can be scaled to much larger um, power consumption levels? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we, we, did, we developed a topology and a system architecture that allows us to you know, scale up to you know, a, a megawatt level for our first first generation go to market product and uh, beyond that we'll you know continue to scale kind of the integrated stack so we can serve the higher and higher power charging stations configurations that are coming online you know referencing back to the e lethal charging hub th those are going to be massive power consuming sites and you're going to need megawatts and megawatts of supplemental power to avoid the grid build out and again it's a time sensitive application where you've got to be in the air and moving people to make money um, same thing with robo taxis; those are more disaggregated, but you want to be charging fast in that in that application as well. So we are thinking about you know more intelligent ways to pull power off the grid and dump to to dump into people's people's cars. Um, the second question was: um, I don't think I saw this in your presentation, but did can you say a little bit about how far you've gotten with commercial traction? Yeah, yeah, sure. So we we do have a partnership with Trium Charging. Um, they're you know kind of like our uh, you know mo most you know most favored partner at this point. We're also working on uh, securing letters letters of intent for our commercial first commercializations and first pilot projects that we we're, we're on track to deliver at, at the end of this year. So we are working with you know a number of notable EV charging companies on specific locations. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we've seen a kind of an outpouring of interest for this technology and are you know, taking those two first commercial demonstrations at the end of this year. Okay, great. And I should, should also note, you know, we, we are closing up our, um, our seed round you know, right at the tail end of it. And you know, if anyone on the call is interested in connecting about that, happy to jump on um, a chat after this.